So the, our topic today that we're going through is aseptic techniques in microbiology. So how familiar you guys are with microbiology? Have you guys ever been exposed to it? You guys know what it is? Have an, maybe have an interest in it? No? Okay, then, all right. Since nobody seems to know what microbiology is. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you guys what microbiology is. You probably are wondering what it is. So microbiology is actually basically just the study of microorganisms. So these are bacteria, fungi, viruses, prokaryotes, anything that you can think of. That's basically what microbiology is in a nutshell. All right, so we're going to be talking. I guess I hope you guys are going to engage with me, you know, because I think this is the first time I'm I'm actually teaching anything to the tropical forest, and my wetlanders are very engaging. So I'm hoping that will be the same for you guys as well. So, what is an aseptic technique? An aseptic technique refers to a procedure that is performed under sterile conditions. So these are procedures to prevent cultures, sterile media stocks, and other solutions from being contaminated by unwanted organisms. So um, can anybody probably say, um, give me a reason to maybe why we do aseptic techniques in the labs, why it's important that we, we do aseptic techniques? Okay, that's what so you're not interested, but it's okay if you're not interested. So anybody can tell me maybe why we do aseptic techniques in the lab. Why is it important? Why are aseptic techniques important in the lab? Anyone? Robin, Natalie? Um, yes, to make sure the results are correct, yes, but that's not the really important reason because, you know, a lot of times if you don't, Try these. Um, if you don't carry out the aseptic techniques properly, other times your results will not be the probably right, or the, the they will be like a bit obscured or anything like that. But the real reasons why we actually carry out aseptic techniques because to prevent contamination of the cultures from farm bacteria in the environment, and also to prevent contamination of us, which are the people and the environment with the organism. Because remember, all the times in microbiology, we're working with bacteria, we're working with viruses, and we don't want to contract or get these viruses. You now we don't want to get sick and then spend like the whole weekend or anything like that being best friends with our toilet or anything like that, right? We don't want to have diabetes, sorry, diarrhea or anything like that. So that's why it's very important that we follow the aseptic techniques that are provided in the labs for us to do. That's why it's very important. So terms in microbiology, so sterilization. So sterilization refers to any process that effectively kills or eliminates trans transmissible agents, which are the fungi, bacteria, viruses, spore forms from a surface, equipment, article or food, medication, biological, cultural medium, and disinfection, which is the cleaning of an article of some of or some or all the pathogenic organisms which may cause infection. So I'm just want to make sure everyone is following, everyone's understanding what's being said so far. I'm not leaving anybody behind. And if you want to ask questions, you can just just tell me to just repeat anything that you did not get. Okay, so we're going, we're continuing along. So, sterilization. So, there are three main methods that I want to introduce to you guys about sterilization. So, this is the application of heat, filtration, and radiation. So, maybe you guys may have probably been introduced at one point that the application of heat is probably the more it's actually the more commonly used method that you'll use in undergrad if you ever go into a microbiology or maybe even a biology lab because even certain labs you'll expect it to learn no aseptic techniques. So heat sterilization, as I said, it's the most commonly used method of sterilization and involves the destruction of enzymes and other essential cell constituents. So we have two types of methods of, drip, of um, 
heat sterilization is this dry heat, which is um, used at 160 degrees Celsius to about 1,800. Um, and it uses glassware and metal objects and powders. These are so these are things that we usually use. To, um, these are um, things that dry heat will use the dry heat method to sterilize. So glassware, metals, and the moist heat is used for things that such as saturated heat under pressure to kill microorganisms and spore. And it's used for certain things such as to sterilize the surgical equipment and even the culture medium that you'll use. So example, if you want to like streak like a plate with like maybe some E. coli or some form of bacteria or anything like that. So this is so that's the what your culture medium would contain, like maybe some form of bacteria, even some algae. That's what your um culture medium. So that's what you're usually working with in the lab. And moist heat is usually operates at a lower temperature than dry heat and it's usually under pressurized steam or heat. So heat sterilization. So dry heat is actually the killing or removal of all micro microorganisms, including bacterial cells, forth, and it's able to penetrate substances more slowly than moist heat. It requires longer exposure times and a higher temperature, as I was saying, than moist heat. And dry heat does most of its damage by oxidizing these molecules. The, the essential cell constituents are destroyed and the organism dies. The temperature is maintained for almost an hour to to kill most difficult of the more resistant spores. And various methods of dry heat sterilization are the flaming, which is wire loop, hot air oven, and incineration. So flaming is when we use like, um, like the Bunsen burner and we use something that's called the wire loop or the inoculating loop. And we'll like use, we'll run the loop along the lines of the flame. To and to sterilize the to, um sterilize the loop when when we're using it in like microbiology or even biology labs. So I'll actually show you guys a video on this later. So moist heat. Oh okay. So moist heat sterilization. So moist heat in the form of saturated steam under pressure is most widely used and it's the most dependable method. We usually use um, an autoclave in when we're using moist heat and I was saying that we use it to sterilize like our culture medium and even like stuff like bandages and things that are used. So moist heat sterilization as I said uses the autoclave and it's commonly used for sterilizing of biohazardous trash, heat and moisture resistant um, materials. So the, the steam actually denatures the enzymes and destroys other like cellular components of, of different bacteria, viruses, and even spore forms. So both the, both the heat sterilization denatures enzymes. But I'm not sure if you guys know, but you know, when after the heat reaches like a certain temperature, you know, these enzymes will start to denature and they are no longer they don't no longer function at the um how they usually would function at their optimum or at their best level. All right, so these instruments that you so the the one that is to your left hand corner, this is the autoclave, as I said, and this works under pressure and steam. So this is what we usually use to like, as I said, to sterilize a culture medium, surgical instruments. Um, this is the Bunsen burner. You usually use it for flaming, and the, when we use the Bunsen burner, it actually helps to create like a sterile um, environments. So we usually, and when we're using it to like, in street plates, you know, we're transferring mediums, we, we try to work as close to the flame as possible. And then we have the hot air oven right here, which we use for metals and even like certain surgical equi equipment as well. So everyone's following, right? No questions, no queries. Everyone's okay. Everyone good? All right, so, all right, let's continue to filter sterilization. Okay, so I don't remember the name of this filter, this specific filter for sterilization, 
but um, filters remove uh, microorganisms from air or liquids. So the DEC filters, including the HEPA filters, are used to remove microorganisms and other contaminants from liquids or air. The membrane filters are used for sterilization of heat sensitive liquids such as pharmaceutical antibiotics and vitamins and nucleation filters are used to isolate specimens for electron microscopy. I think this is the membrane filter, I'm not sure. Are generally um, 0 0.22 to 0.45 um, micrometer in size and are made of nylon or nitrous cellulose. So this is the, the filter and this, you see the filter paper at the, and then you have sterilization so this is another common method. So radiation sterilization. Um, so this radiation sterilization re relies on actually ionizing radiation, primarily gamma, X-ray, and electron radiation to deactivate the microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi, viruses, and spore. Due to numerous advantages over heat or chemical-based sterilization, this method is particularly attractive in medicine and healthcare-related fields. So the UV radiation, it actually uses a wavelength of about 200 nanometer to kill microorganisms, and this destroys the basis of nucleic acid and inactivate viruses, and use is limited only for like sterilization of surfaces, and some transparent objects. objects. Um, I remember earlier we mentioned that um, some sterilization techniques are also used to um, sterilize food. So the UV radiation is actually one of the rate, um, one of the techniques that we use when we're actually disinfecting like water. So to because a lot of times um, our water will probably have certain parasites. So Compared to like maybe like chlorine or something that we would use to disinfect certain parasites, such as maybe GRD. I know you guys are not familiar with some of these names, but the the radiation is actually more effective against the spores and some of these um parasites such as GRD more than if you use chlorine. So this is one of the common ways in which we can use ultraviolet or UV radiation, not just on surgical are things that we use in the lab, but also on food as well. So gamma radiation is the most popular form of radiation sterilization. Gamma radiation is usually emitted from the radioisotope cobalt-60. I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with isotopes and how far you guys reach in chemistry. And they are penetrating and commonly used for sterilization. Chat. Okay, so somebody said they look so far. Okay, so um, they are penetrating and commonly used for sterilization of disposable medical equipment, syringes, needles, cannulas, IV sets, requires bulky shielding for safety of operators, and they also require storage of the radioisotopes. So aseptic techniques that it involves the manipulation of the following skills, flaming, and we were saying before, flaming is when you use that the inoculating loop or the inoculating wire, and we run it across the flame and to make sure that we're sterilizing it before we use it to transfer our cultures when we're picking colonies, because when we're doing street plating, when we do an agar um, place, these are um, times when aseptic techniques is always important because you don't want to, um, as we were saying before, you don't want to make the the culture that you're working with, you don't want to make it be infected with other organisms that are in the environment as well. Also, it's also important when you're doing these aseptic techniques to always wash your hands before starting because you know, as we have normal everyone has normal microflora on their hands and that just means that microbes, microorganisms are found everywhere. They're on your skin, they're, on, they're in your stomach, they're in your mouth and these are just what we call, these are just normal or microorganisms that are just are present everywhere. They're not going to do anything to you unless you're in a state where you're immunocompromised, meaning that you're your health is like maybe you have like HIV or a certain illness. So these are, you don't have to worry about these microorganisms or anything like that. But 
we don't want these microorganisms coming in contact with the organism that we're working with. So it's very important that when we're working in the lab, that we wash our hands and we take eight steps to um, ensure that we're um, being clean and in our environment as well. So. so this is the inoculating loop I was saying before. So what happens is that you'll run the whole inoculating loop and it's heated onto this red hot and the organisms are sometimes dispersed by shaking the tube. So before um, we, we, we use the, um, so we'll flame the tube, and so we'll take off the cap and we'll flame the tube and the mouse office is flamed and then a loop full of the organism is removed from the tube. So before even, make sure that anytime when you're using the inoculating loop, it's also important that you guys give time for the inoculating loop to also cool. You don't want to just put it in your culture just like that in your agar medium just like that because you will end up killing your your culture as well remember say this is how we want to kill any or sterilize any unwanted microorganism we don't want to kill the culture that we're working with as well guys so the loop is removed from the culture and the tube is flamed again before closing and then with when we put the, the tube enclosure on the, or the cap on the tube. So this is how we usually do the flaming method. Also, I want you guys to watch a video. I'm hoping you guys can hear clearly. If not, we can probably I'll find the next one. So everyone can see the video, right? That is that's about to be shown. Let me just make sure my share computer sound so you guys can hear. Surrounded by a host of tiny microscopic organisms that we can't see. Yet these organisms can cause complete havoc. They can cause devastating pandemics. They can also be cooked, put to very good use. They're used in recombinant DNA. They're little mini factories used in beer manufacture, bread making, antibiotic production. However, you need to think how we're going to work with these microorganisms and how we're going to work safely with these microorganisms. In this series of videos, we've put together some clips of the key procedures used in microbiology. Practical microbiology is critical to the science. From working in the microbiology lab, there's three reasons why you have to use good microbial practice. The first of these, of course, is safety. You need to prevent yourself from becoming contaminated from the microbe you're handling. You also need to consider those around you. So you have to prevent dissemination of the microbe into the environment. You don't want the person next to you to come down with the disease from the microbe you're working with. There's one other reason that may not be immediately evident, and that is you need to protect the sample that you're working with. If you've just been on an expedition to Mars or to the polar cap to Antarctica and you've come back with a sample of microbes that may grow in an extreme environment, the last thing you want to do is to isolate Staphylococcus aureus that grows in your hand and say this is the microbe you've isolated. So for those of you guys who don't know what she's saying, Staphylococcus aureus is actually a bacteria that's normally found on your skin. As I was saying before, we have normal microflora. So those are normally these are microorganisms that are normally found on your skin. They don't they don't have anything to they don't want to cause any illness or anything like that, unless your body is immunocompromised, meaning you had like an illness or like you're having cancer, like HIV. So it's not anything. So these organisms are nothing to be afraid of. They won't do you anything on a normal basis isolated from this extreme environment. So containment of the microbe in the tube you're working with or the plate you're working with as well as protection of your sample from microbes on your body. Okay the first thing you have to do when working safely in the microbiology lab is to wear a lab coat. In microbiology labs the lab coats are special coats. They have elastic around the arms so that nothing goes up your arms and they go the tie right up to your neck and you should tie the front of the lab coat so that it's completely tied. Now there's certain rules we have working in the microbiology lab. In addition to wearing your lab coat, 
You never ever bring any food or drink into the lab. Nothing should touch your mouth. No chewing gum. You don't put your fingers in the mouth. You don't put the end of your pen in your mouth. That completely avoids risk. There should, of course, be no contamination on your hands. If you should at any point spill anything on your hands, you would then come to the base and wash your hands, disinfecting them before you continue on working again. If you're thirsty during the practical, what you do is you come here, you you take- Also guys, something that she didn't mention, but I want you guys to note is that when you're in the lab, you're also required to wear long pants. And you also to work required to wear close to shoes. So your toes can't be out or anything like that in the lab. Take off your lab coat, you disinfect your hands, you go out and take a drink of water outside the lab and then come back in again. If you happen to have any cuts on your hand, these are a portal of access for microbes. Therefore, any small cut should be covered with an elastic, a plaster. If you have long hair, you must have it tied back behind your back. It's very important that you have a well-organized bench space. You'll be working with both liquid cultures of bacteria and solid cultures. Liquid cultures should be in a test tube rack. Your solid cultures will be in the plates. Organize yourself so that you never have to stretch over a bunsen to reach anything. In addition, you'll be needing to take notes during the practical. Leave a space to write notes. And remember, you never ever put a plate on top of a lab book. If your lab book is contaminated, we autoclave it to destroy it. Remember, microbes are invisible and you don't want to risk any contamination. Jane is now going to show you how to work with and handle liquid cultures and solid cultures um, containing the cultures in the tube, protecting yourself, protecting those around you, and protecting the sample from contamination. So everyone's following so far, right? Everyone's okay? Yes. Okay, all right, that's good. The lab should be laid out with all the equipment and materials you need for the exercise you're going to do. For example, here you can see we've got an automatic pipetta and sterile tips some liquid broth cultures, some empty broth tubes, some plates and a plate culture. Before lighting your Bunsen burner, it's important to check that the rubber tubing attached is securely connected to the gas tap. When you're using it, you can move the Bunsen burner around to make sure it's in an appropriate position for your work, but try not to move it too far and loosen the connection on the gas tap. When doing your practice, what just happened? <laughs> What's going on here? I feel like my internet is not working today, guys. I'm so sorry. Give me a moment. Let's figure out what's happening. Oh, shoot, I went up too far. <sighs> I don't know why this is happening today. The videos are working so fine the other days. Very low them page. Wondershare Filmora is a user friendly, easy to use video editing software which contains hundreds of special. If you're using it, you can move the Gabunson runner around to make sure it's in an appropriate position okay, for your work. Kind of try not to move it too far and loosen the connection on the gas tap. When doing your practical, it's very important to work in the correct manner. The use of aseptic technique not only protects you and your fellow workers, but also your work. So the first thing we're going to do is light the Bunsen burner, which provides you an area of sterile working space. Yeah, so what the Bunsen burner one, the heat it actually creates that environment. So the the that's why it's important when you're using the Bunsen burner to work as closely to it as possible, guys. So that's why when we're using items, it, we're if you need to, to clear a space around your Bunsen, turn on the gas, close the air hole, and light it with the lighter provided. When you're not using your Bunsen. 
leave it on a open the close the air hole and leave it on a nice yellow flame. When you're when it's in use, we open the air hole and have a nice blue cone. It's important to work safely when you're working in the lab. Keep your lab books and your notebooks away from your work and remember never to place your plates on top of these because there could be a risk of contamination. So try and work as tidily as possible. If you have equipment you don't need till later on in the session, perhaps move it to the back of the bench to give yourself a bit more room. So we're going to show you now how to streak a plate using good aseptic technique. So um, for guys who probably don't understand, so what she's going to do is what is called the street plate technique and those round little things that what she has near the Bunsen burner, those are called agar plates and that's what we usually have, the medium that the, the culture or the bacteria will grow on for those who are probably a little lost. One of the most important aspects. So what she has in her hand, I was saying, oh, you guys probably can't see clearly, but I think it's probably will see clearly soon, is she has the inoculating loop. And that's what we use when we're doing the street plating and even sometimes transferring organisms from one coach from the, like, the tube to the plate or something like that. Based such a technique is flaming your loop. You need to make sure that your loop is sterile before you use it. And we do this in a specific way. We put the loop into the flame, into the top of the flame, and draw it up slowly through the flame so that the loop is the last part to be heated. Yeah. So and this then is move it from the flame and just allow it to air cool. It's important to remember not to put this down on the bench now, otherwise you'll have to start again. So guys, anybody knows why we we'll make it cool before we just we don't just put it in the the medium just like that. I think I mentioned it before. Okay then, so I was saying that we don't just put it in the media, we allow it to cool because remember that we don't want to essentially kill the organism that we're working with. Because when we're when we're using it, we don't want to transfer, if we're going to transfer the organism and then we'll put the hot inoculating loop in it and then we're going to kill the organism. As you will have contaminated it. We're now ready to work with our bacteria. When you see an agar plate in the lab, it'll always be presented to you lid down. That enables you to pick it up and have the bacterial side in your hand, ready to work with. When the plates are incubated, they're always incubated lid side down to avoid condensation appearing on the surface of the agar. Take a well isolated colony from your plate with a cool, sterile loop. Place the agar plate onto its lid. Take a fresh plate and streak as we've shown in the other video clip. I think tomorrow class At this point, it's important to remember when flaming your loop you between inoculations that you do not cause any residue that might be present on the loop to splutter. So it's important to draw the loop very slowly up through the flame, especially when you've finished your work. I'm now going to show you how to inoculate from a broth culture. Take your pre-grown broth culture and having your flamed cooled loop in your right hand, put place the lid of the test tube in your small finger. Remove the lid of the tube and flame the neck of the test tube. Place your loop into the broth culture and collect a loop ball of culture. Flame the neck of the tube and replace the lid. Always make sure you put this back in a rack to avoid any spillages. We're now going to take a fresh tube and inoculate it. So as before, we remove the lid of the tube with our pinky finger, flame the neck of the tube, place the loop full of culture in the broth, remove our loop, flame the neck of the tube, turn the lid and place in our rack. We've now got a loop full of liquid in our loop, which we need to make sure we sterilise without causing any splutter. So we're going to draw this very slowly up through the flame and make sure we don't spit and splutter across the bench. When you've finished inoculating your plates or tubes, it's important to remember that you label them. 
Label in small writing around the edge okay, of the plate. So, so this is it, guys. So also, I think a step that they didn't show is also it's very important at the starting of any lab to also make sure you clean your bench area. So usually we use like 70% all clothes so we can wipe down the area and make sure it's clean of any microbes or anything that unwanted organisms so that's also part of it so i think yeah we finish on time so you guys can now go on your break and come back for your next session so from 10 30 to 11 so by 11 will be start you guys can come back for your next session but before we go, anybody wants to ask any questions, any queries, anything you guys not sure on, tomorrow I will probably show you guys um, how the street paint looks. So you guys probably can get a better understanding on it and what exactly the street paint is. But anybody has any questions they want to ask before we go? Okay, you so said you don't understand what she was doing with the cultures. Okay, I'll probably try to find a video that's probably more clearer. Okay, so basically what she was doing, it was she was transferring one bacteria um, culture to the next to another, but I'll try to find a video tomorrow and that will probably be more clearer and probably explain it a little more so you can see what's happening. And I'll also try to find a video on street plating as well.